read something to you, and I want to ask you guys a question. How many people have ever heard of a man named Ed Kimball? One person. All right, then you know where I'm going with this then. If you guys have ever heard of Mr. Kimball, you would know where I'm going with this, but for most of you guys, you haven't. But let me read a story to you. Mr. Kimball was a Sunday school teacher, and he was a Sunday school teacher, and he had some teenagers in his class, and one of, his, one of the kids in his class had the name Dwight L. Moody. How many people have ever heard of Dwight L. Moody? Okay, a lot of you guys have heard of D.L. Moody. He is a famous evangelist, and he had many evangelistic, mes- uh, ev- evangelistic meetings and traveled around. He was very famous. Uh, he even has a, uh, a Bible Institute in Chicago, Moody Bible Institute. Uh, there's also Moody Press. They uh, produce a lot of uh, Christian publications and books. But I want you to hear D.L. Moody's salvation story from, a, from the perspective of Ed Kimball. So, he w- so Ed Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. One of his students was D.L. Moody, and he had a good relationship with his Sunday school students. Also at the time, D.L. Moody was working in a shoe, a shoe store. So this is the words of Mr. Kimball. I started down to Holton's shoe store. When I was nearly there, I began to wonder whether I ought to go just then, during business hours. And I thought that maybe my mission might embarrass the boy. I want you guys to hear kind of his thoughts about the whole thing. Oh, I don't know if I should go now. Maybe I should wait until after hours. Don't want to embarrass him. I thought that when I went away, the other clerks might ask who, that, who I was. And when they learned, they might taunt Moody and ask if I was trying to make a good boy out of him. While I was thinking over it, I passed the store without noticing. Then when I found out that I had gone past the door, I determined to make a dash for it and have it over at once. Okay, so first he's wondering, should I, shouldn't I? Don't want to embarrass the guy. All right, let's go and get it done with. I don't want to, I don't want to put, this, put this on any longer than it has to go. So I found Moody in the back part of the store, wrapping up shoes and paper and putting them on the shelves. I went up to him and put my hand on his shoulder. And as I leaned over, I placed my foot upon a shoebox. Then I made my plea. And I feel that it was a very weak one. I don't know just what words I used, nor could Moody tell. I simply told him of Christ's love for him and the love Christ wanted in return. That was all there was of it. I think Mr. Moody said afterward, afterward that there were tears in my eyes. It seemed that the young man was just ready for the light that then broke upon him. For there at once, in the back of that shoe store in Boston, the future great evangelist gave himself and his life to Christ. You see Ed Kimball's thoughts and his attitudes Oh, should I? Shouldn't I? I don't want to embarrass him. Maybe I'll put it off to another day, or maybe I'll just go and get it over with, or I don't really have good words to say. How many people, when you're thinking about evangelism, evangelism have had any of those thoughts at all? Lift your hand. When you're getting ready to tell somebody, oh, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. We all do, okay? We've all thought those, th- those thoughts. But listen to what... D.L. Moody says, Many years afterward, Mr. Moody himself told the story of that day. When I was in Boston, he said, I used to attend a Sunday school class, and one day my teacher came around behind the corner of the shop I was working at and put his hand on my shoulder and talked to me about Christ and my soul. I had not felt that I even had a soul until then. I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here is a man who never saw me until lately, and now he is weeping over my sins. And I never shed a tear about them. So that's what D.L. Moody was saying. Here's a man who is crying over my sins, and I have never even once shed a tear about my own sins. But I understand it now, and I know what it is to have a passion for men's souls and weep over their sins. I don't remember what he said but I can feel the power of that man's hand on my shoulder tonight. It was not long after that I was brought into the kingdom of God. Isn't that powerful? Here was a man, Ed Kimball, 
who was simply obedient. He was questioning in his mind. He was wrestling with thoughts in his mind, but he said, okay, I'll do it. Mostly he said, I'll do it because I want to get it over with. But he did it. And we see from D.L. Moody's story how much of a massive impact that was on his life. God wants to use each one of us in the same way. Amen? Being an evangelist is not about standing on the street corner and leading thousands and thousands and thousands of people, but just focusing on the one. Who has God put in your life? We may not be able to be a, a D.L. Moody, but we can all certainly be an Ed Kimball. Isn't that right? We don't need to be a D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody went on. He was one of the famous evangelists, leading many, many people to the Lord. I even read, I even read online, actually, and I, it's an unverified story, but there was kind of like a, a Christian genealogy, if you will, that Ed Kimball led D.L. Moody to the Lord, and because of D.L. Moody's services, one of his evangelistic services, somebody else got saved, somebody else. Billy Sunday ended up getting saved, all the way down through to Billy Graham. It was kind of like a, a genealogy of people who got saved just because of, we could say D.L. Moody, but we could say because of Ed Kimball. And we don't know who God has put in our lives, but we need to be faithful to the people that he has put in our lives. Amen? There's another story that's a little closer to home. Uh, here in our church, there was a man who came over back in, I'll probably get the year wrong, but I think it was 1994. Maybe it was 1994 or 1995. I wasn't here at the time, uh, but there was a team that came over from the States, and they were involved in evangelism here with New Life Fellowship. Now, New Life Fellowship was a lot smaller then, just getting started in those years. But this man from the States, he, they, they would go as a team to the Royal University of Phnom Penh and do evangelism with the students there. And so they would go, they would just kind of uh, talk to people, say hello, chit-chat with people, and then invite them to come to a Bible study that they were having uh, in, a, in a house over in Tolcourt area. So this man from the States led someone to, from the university to, the, to uh, the house, to the Bible study. And he, this man ended up giving his life to the Lord and becoming a part of the church. And it was, uh, it was Brother Heng Sota. And he was the first man who gave his life to the Lord here, first Cambodian who gave his life to the Lord here at New Life Fellowship, and he's been a pillar in our church. He's like the grandfather here in our church, and he's still serving God strong, evangelizing, planting churches all through Cambodia. And this man from the States has never come back. Just one time, he was faithful to the Lord, doing what God asked him to do, kind of like Ed Kimball leads one person to the Lord, but man, it's revolutionary for a city and for a country because of one person's faithfulness. That's who God calls us to be. He doesn't necessarily call us to be, you know, this great evangelist, but he wants us to be faithful. He wants us to be faithful. And one more illustration, kind of along this idea of, of taking time for the one, is uh, there was a man who was walking along the beach, and it was when the tide was out, and there was a whole bunch of starfish that were stranded on the beach. They had come in when the water was up, and then they all got stranded on the beach, and the water got it, went, out, went away. And so this man, he was, was walking along the beach. And so he was walking from one side to the other, and there's lots of starfish scattered all over the place. And so he just picks up one, and he tosses it back in the water. He walks a little bit further picks up the next one, tosses it back in the water, walks for a little bit longer, passes some as he goes, you know, just kind of not trying to save, save every single starfish, but he just picks them up and, you know, tosses them back in the water. And there's another guy who was watching him. And he goes, you're crazy. He says, what are you doing? You're, 
You're not going to be able to save all of those starfish. You're not making a difference. You're only taking like one at a time. You're not making a, a difference at all with any of these starfish. And he says, I'm making a difference for that one. I'm making a difference for the one that I threw back in the ocean. And that's an important way to think about it. We, we may not be able to meet everybody. We may not be able to do everything, but let's take time for the one. Let's pick it up, toss it back in. God cares about each one of us. There was somebody who took time for us, right? You can probably think back in your own life about the one who took time for you. You could probably name their name right now. Man, I remember they took that time for me. They took that time for me. This person loved me enough to come pick me up and take me out and take me out for a coffee or chat with me about this or encourage me in this way. Someone took time for you. We need to have that same outlook. That this is an evangelistic time. God is bringing people your way. I believe with all my heart that God is bringing people your way. Take the time for the one. Take the time for the one. You don't know if you're being an Ed Kimball. You don't know if that person that you're leading to the Lord is a D.L. Moody or not. But even if he's not, at least you're, how, you're making a difference for the one. Isn't that good? Let me read a couple of verses. I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then I have a couple points that I'm going to end up with. First one is Luke 10, 1 to 9. This is some, the words of Jesus as he was sending out his disciples. We get that up on the screen there, Luke 10. If you have your Bible, you can open it up. If not, you have it up on the screen there. I got it here, so I'm just going to read it. I just want you to look at all of the points that Jesus was encouraging the disciples as he was sending them out. Luke 10, 1 to 9. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Hey, remember that. The harvest is plentiful, but the labor, laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Amen. That was God's that was Jesus' declaration. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near you. Change the way you're thinking. Alter the way that you live, your, your thoughts, your lifestyle, your, your perspective, your worldview. Change that. The kingdom of God is near. That was the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples and taught them to proclaim as they were going from place to place. It's interesting, we were taught, we've been talking about uh, peace. In the last series, we were talking about peace. And Jesus says, when you go into a village, say, peace be on you. Peace be on you. Now, sometimes uh, some of the disciples, when they got upset, they wanted to bring down fire and brimstone on the place. But Jesus said, don't do that. Speak peace. When you enter into a place, speak peace to that place. God wants us to live like him and to represent him. And God is a God of love. God is a God of peace. And God expects us to represent him and speak peace to people as well. And so when we enter into a place or when we meet with someone, don't start talking to them about, you know, hell and all this sort of stuff. Speak peace. The truth is, the people who are most ready for the gospel they know they've got problems already. Most people know there's something wrong. Just haven't figured out what it is yet. And so when we come and we speak peace to people, no, there is hope. 
there is a future. There is a true love. There is true peace that you can experience. There is an abundant life. It opens up people's eyes and say, what, really? That's truth? I've longed for something, but I've never known what it is. That is what opens up people's hearts, and they want that peace. It says that if the peace doesn't settle on people, let it come back on you. Don't stress about it. Don't be like, oh, I did wrong because they didn't, they didn't accept me. No, let the peace come back on you. That's God's, that's God's job to worry about all that stuff. But we can speak peace from God. So that's what Jesus encouraged the disciples to do and to say as they were going into a new place and as they were meeting with people and as they were evangelizing. But we also learn a few more points from an actual story uh, in the Bible where Jesus displays some of the ways that he was evangelistic and some of the ways that he reached out to people. And it's a little bit of a longer story, but I feel it's important for us to read through the whole thing. And then I'm going to take a few points out of it before we finish. It's in John chapter 4, and it's the story of when Jesus went to Samaria. And he went to a city. Disciples went into the city, but he stayed outside the city near a well. And he met a Samaritan woman at the well. And this is the story that happened. So Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Okay? If you've ever seen a map of Israel, Jerusalem and Judea is in the south. Galilee and Nazareth, the area where Jesus was born, is up in the north. So we have Judea, Jerusalem, and then Galilee and Nazareth way up in the north. In between that is a region called Samaria. Now, Samaria, if you look in the history of Israel, Samaria and Samaritans were people who were basically, for lack of a better term, they were half Jews and half Gentiles uh, because they were children of people who had intermarried with other nations. And in order to prove yourself as an Israelite, in those days especially, in order to prove yourself as a good Israelite, you had to be able to trace your genealogy from where you were all the way back to Abraham. And if you could do that, then you could prove that you were a good Israelite. Samaritans, mostly, they couldn't do that. And so they were looked down on by the Jews because they could not trace their pure lineage back to Abraham. But they were half Jews. Okay? And so what people ended up doing, because there was so much racism and prejudice at the time, a lot of the Jews would actually cross over the Jordan, and then they would travel north, and then back over into Galilee. So they would try to avoid Samaria as much as they could when they were traveling back and forth. But Jesus didn't avoid the Samaria. Um, so Jesus, it says, he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, which is about noontime. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. So Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you... A Jew asked for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. So she was talking about this racism between the Samaritans and the Jews. Why in the world would you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan? And not just a Samaritan, but a woman, a Samaritan woman. Why would you ask me for a drink? That's something that would be unheard of at that time. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God... And who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is so deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water 
will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water, the water that I will give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I, won't be, I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So then Jesus changes from the natural into the spiritual. He says, you know, we're talking about natural water, but then he starts talking about the, the water, the living water that gives eternal life. And then Jesus changes the subject again. He says, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, yes, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, A woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the first time that Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah to a Samaritan woman. Very, very significant. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. So they couldn't believe it. it was, oh, we, J Jesus, we left you here outside the city so you wouldn't have to go in and be among all those Samaritans in that city. And then they come back and, like, whoa, he's talking to a Samaritan. Jesus, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be doing that. You're a good Jew. You shouldn't be talking to a Samaritan woman. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why, you're, why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. I'll skip down a little bit. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. So in these two passages, there are some key points that I think that we can take as we are looking outside of ourselves and we're looking to be people who make a difference for the one. Before I get to those points, I, I do want to say, too, that Jesus went out of his way for the one. He risked embarrassment. He risked his reputation. He risked what people would say is clean and unclean and him associating with people who, who he wouldn't normally associate or his people wouldn't normally associate with. Jesus is our example. We can't, make, we can't be ones who say yes and no to the people that God brings our way. We have to just say yes, because our lives are not our own. We are bought with a price. And so the people that God brings our way to say, okay, God, this is the one, and be faithful to the Holy Spirit, to the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. All right, let's get to the principles. Number one, go out of your way to engage people. Jesus, he went out of his way. He went, he purposely went to the Samaritans. He purposely went through this, he went through Samaria. Most people, most good Jews, they would cross the Jordan River, go north, and then cross back over in order to get to Galilee and to that area. But Jesus, but Jesus didn't do that. He said, okay, disciples, we're going to go, we're going to take the shortcut, but we're going to go right through Samaria. And it's interesting that Jesus said, 
the Bible says, because he had to go through Samaria. So he took that route. He didn't avoid people. He didn't go out of his way to avoid people. I think sometimes there's certain peoples in our lives that maybe we uh, re- respond to them in a little bit of flesh. Like, oh, man, I don't want to talk to them again. I don't want to, you know, I see them again or I think this way about them. No, don't do that. Let's be like Jesus. Let's be intentional. I mean, let's be intentional in make, making those steps, taking that route that will lead us into the pathway of people that we might not normally talk to or we might not normally spend time with. Let's be intention, intentional in engaging people. Next step, next principle is life and living are not always the main thing. Jesus was tired. It was the middle of the day. He was hungry and he was thirsty. And he said to the woman, give me something to drink. But that wasn't his main intention. He wanted to engage this woman on her level in order to get into her heart and to speak to her soul. And so sometimes when we meet people, sometimes we might be a little bit tired. They come and ask us to pray for them or... or Maybe we were walking home one, one day and we happened to see somebody or something's going on. Or Just remember that life and living are not always the main thing. It's obviously important. Jesus got his lunch. He got his water. He got a nap probably later on. But the main thing for Jesus was to meet this woman at her level and to bring the revelation of the Messiah into her but not just to her. He knew that she was key in reaching the whole city. We see later on that this people from the city came out. They knew this woman, and when she went back in and told them this was something that was very, very strange for her. She never acted this way, but she was so excited that she met Jesus that she led the whole city, and probably the whole city gave their lives to the Lord and started to believe in Jesus. So, Jesus knew that the water wasn't the main thing. It was the beginning, but it wasn't the main thing. In the first, in the first uh, passage that we read, uh, Jesus says, don't go from house to house. Stay with the first person that accepts you. And so the next principle would be don't be picky about who accepts you. Don't be picky. Don't say... Oh, maybe this, ah, maybe this person isn't so influential in the city. No, God led you to that person. God led you to that person. Make a difference for that one. Maybe they won't be a D.L. Moody. Okay, that's okay. Everybody needs the gospel, not just the D.L. Moody's, right? Everybody. So don't be picky about who accepts you. Don't be in a rush to say, let's go find the next person or let's go find the next person. No, sometimes it's a matter of time. Sometimes it's a matter of time, spending time with that person, getting to know them, asking questions about their life and their family and their dreams and all of those things. Build good relationships with people. The next principle, don't judge people based on what you see or what you hear or what you know about them. This woman was a Samaritan. She was a half-breed. She, was a, she wasn't a full Jew. She was a Samaritan, okay? She was a woman, okay, which in those days kind of lowered her, her uh, social status. The Bible also tells us about her sin. She was, uh, you know, she, was, she had lots of husbands. She was probably living in adultery. And she was also a, a woman from a town named Sikar, which the meaning of the name Sikar means drunken. So this town had a reputation of being a bunch of drunks. But Jesus still went to her. So even though he knew all about knew all these things about her, he didn't judge her and say, No, I can't talk to her. She won't accept me. Sometimes we're thinking, oh, you know, she's maybe this person's too far gone, or there's too much sin in their lives, or uh, how can they make a difference? No, Jesus didn't judge her. 
Jesus was perfect. He could have judged her if he wanted, but he didn't. He reached out to her in love. And so even though people have a reputation, even though we know something about people, even though we assume things about people, still go after the one because God still loves them and they still have a place in his kingdom. Next, don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, there's a story of a missionary named Dennis Balcom when he first went to China. And when he got to China, all of his contacts there just kind of disappeared. He didn't have any contacts with anybody. Uh, he was supposed to meet with this person. They couldn't be in the country. He was supposed to meet with this person. They couldn't be in the country. And so what he ended up doing is he just sat himself at the, at the door of a Chinese family. And he just sat there. He was a young guy. He was just following the Holy Spirit. And what ended up happening is that family took him in. It was kind of their obligation to do it because they had to and stuff is with Chinese culture and stuff. But that attitude and that thought of putting ourselves at the need or, or, or expressing needs for people to help us opens up people's hearts to us. If you study uh, like, like missions work and that sort of thing, that's actually a principle in missiology where people, when you say that you need something from somebody, they will start helping you, but it actually opens up their heart to you. And so, you know, whether it be, oh, can you teach me English? Or can you help me with this? Or can you help me go to the market and find this or do that? People will open up their hearts to you because they feel like they owe you something. But it's actually a way to get into people's lives and build relationships. And they will start to trust you. They'll start to open up to you and you become part of their family. But we see that's what Jesus did. He said, can I have some water? And the woman's like, she was a little bit confused by it. But she's like, all right, okay, here's some water for you. And, and it starts to open up people's hearts to you. And so don't be afraid to ask people for help. Next point, be a person of peace. We talked a little bit about this already. Everywhere you go, peace. Bring the peace of God. Bring the blessing of God. Bring hope and life. And truth, you bring all these things in the truth of the word of God, but be a person of peace. Next, if they reject you, don't, uh, sorry, if they reject you, let your peace return to you. Don't get stressed out. Don't get worried. The truth is, God's leading you. God tells you the words to say. He can take care of the results. He can take care of it. If we are representing our Savior and we're representing the kingdom well, they are not rejecting us, but essentially they are rejecting Jesus. The truth is, don't stress about whether or not people reject you or they accept you. In the Bible, some people rejected Jesus as well. Some people accepted Jesus. You're going to get both in your life. But we need to be faithful to what God has put on our heart, just like Ed Kimball was in this story. Even amidst all of his questions, he was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And final thing is, we kind of covered this at the beginning, but don't worry if you don't reach many, many people. Make a difference for the one. Don't be thinking this many or this many or this many. That can kind of sometimes be a stumbling block because it affects how we speak to others, how we reach out to others. But make a difference for the ones that Jesus brings to you. This is a season of hope. The season of hope. When hope came down from heaven in the form of a baby and brought hope to the world. But some people outside of the church, they still don't know about that hope. But God has put hope within each one of you. So don't be afraid to speak about the hope that God has put within you. Don't be afraid to speak about the peace that God has put within you. Because God has chosen you. You're living and you're breathing in, in December, December 2019 for a reason. God has you here. But not just for a reason. He brought you here for a people as well. There are people that only you can touch. D.L. Moody was the person that only Ed Kimball could touch. 
Who out there are the people that only you can touch? Use some of these principles. Don't be afraid. Make a difference for the one. Amen? Why don't we stand together? And I'm not going to have an altar call for people who want to give their lives to being an evangelist because the truth is God has called each one of us to. Amen? Now, there are some people that have the gift of evangelism, and that's fantastic, but that's not exactly what we're talking about tonight or today. God has a calling for each one of us to be fruitful, to multiply, to have open hearts that expand and see beyond ourselves, see that one that's near us. So if you're willing, and if you want to say, God, use me, let's lift up our hands together. Lift up both our hands if you're willing, okay? Don't do it if you're not, because, you know, we want to be truthful with God. Let's say, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for each one who has lifted up their hands and say, God, use me for the one. God, you have put people in my path. There are people that only I can have an impact on. So God, here I am. Maybe it's my friends. Maybe it's my neighbors. Maybe it's my Kamai teacher. Maybe it's this person. Maybe it's that person. Maybe it's the person who works at the market who I have an, a, 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 a relationship with. God, use me in their lives. Use me in their lives, I pray, God. Use me, I pray. God, I thank you so much that you have given the gift of the Holy Spirit to me, to each one of us. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide God, I pray that as I am faithful, you would show me these principles that can help to reach that one. And God, you know what the future holds. You know who that one will become. So God, today we dedicate ourselves to you. We open up our hearts to you and we say, God, my life is in your hands. We love you so much. God, we thank you that there was someone who took the time for us. Help us to be people who take the time for others. We love you. We thank you for your kingdom. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go out and do it. Amen. Let's not just, oh yeah, that was good, but let's go out and do it. Amen. And if anybody has prayer requests, you need healing, you need, maybe you have a family member that needs a, bit, a touch of God, we have our leaders up at the front. You come on up. We'll be here for the next little bit. Come meet with us. Share your prayer requests. We'll join our faith together, and we'll see God's kingdom come down. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.